The Club Championship Show on OTB Sports in partnership with AIB, proud sponsors of the Football Hurling and Camogie All-Ireland Club Championships. Hashtag the toughest. Welcome along to this week's edition of the Club Championship Show here on OTB Sports, brought to you by AIB. Coming up over the next 40 minutes or so, Kilku defend their Ulster title and will now be looking to push on to an All-Ireland decider. They will take on a St Finbar side who are Munster champions for the first time since 1986, having overcome Austin Stacks in Thurless at the weekend. That's the game that Tommy Rooney of the Football Pod was at. And Tommy is with me now to take a look back at all the football. We'll be talking to Michael Verney about two intriguing hurling encounters in the semi-finals of the All-Ireland Club championship a little bit later but Tommy how are you getting on? Well how are you doing how are things? Good we're going to talk Kilku we're going to be talking to Aidan Brannigan their joint captain uh, who went up yes. to accept the cup as a joint captain two men lifting the cup horror I'm sure for some GA administrators who voted <laughs> a couple of years ago Tommy to get rid of this 100% uh, it's like they're just one of those rules Will that came in and hopefully will disappear again I don't know whether there's a motion to get rid of it at Congress this year I think I heard word that it might be gotten rid of at some stage but fair play to Kilku what a club I'm looking forward to, to chatting to Aidan. Um, the amount of brothers on that panel at the weekend. Actually, the amount of brothers in that game mm. with the Joneses from Derry Gonnelly as well was, was something to behold. So that's uh, one of the beauties of the club championship. We're getting so many stories like that. We had it with the McGraths and all their cousins and brothers on the Lockmore Castellani teams before. So, yeah, that's a uh, great story. So looking forward to chatting to Aidan about that. Yeah, we'll touch in a lot more detail about what happened at Thurlis at the weekend with that Cork mm. and Kerry clash. But um, what a start to a game. I mean, you must have been barely nestled oh, in your seat and the ball was in the net. Yeah, I, I would now. I was in Semple early at at the weekend, and I say I was one of the last ones to leave. And I was telling Paddy and Andy on the football pod that uh, one of the stewards was roaring at me from the bottom up to the press box, asking me to move my uh, move my car from the 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 back pitch. So um, unbelievable! Eighteen seconds in, and you could kind of see it. Like you, you you have your eye in the game, and you could see Connor Jordan was a little bit unsettled. The stack centre back, he had chased Brian Hayes back to the edge of the square. Hayes was starting was a late starter instead of Michael Shields. Now the Finbars lads knew that Shields wasn't going to start. Hayes is a big man. He had a very good game. Kicked three points. He's on the edge of the square and you're seeing Jordan going back on him and there's, you know, nearly asking questions like, you know, what's going on here? He was obviously tasked with following him. Um, a ball in wasn't amazing. Hayes does enough, gets a flick in it and Killian Myers-Murray buries it past, uh, past Wayne Cairns and the Stacks goal. So, some start to the game and Stacks did not recover until half time. Now, they were awesome in the third quarter. We'll get into it in a few minutes. They were absolutely awesome in the third quarter. But, uh, yeah, what a, what a start to that game. Yeah, dare I suggest it was kind of an Austin Stacks type goal that was scored by St. Finbars yeah. early on, stolen directly out of the playbook. If you want to get in contact with us, you can tweet us at Off the Ball or you can leave a comment, of course, on the YouTube stream if you want to get in contact. But let's have a chat about Kilku against Derry Gonley. Kilku winning in the end by three goals and ten points to three points. A really, really dominant display. Uh, Derry Gonley ceding a lot of territory during the game. Uh, Kilku getting themselves into a very strong position, one five to two points up at half time, thanks to a goal from Daryl Brannigan. Then there were goals late in the game from Caleb. Doherty and from Sheelan Johnson uh, which just was that extra bit of gloss on the victory that they had at the end uh, we had a very entertaining interview on OTB at the weekend afterwards this is Niall Kane, the goalkeeper uh, from Kilku speaking to Ash O'Reilly after their victory in the Athletics Grounds oh, It's brilliant it's, uh, it's hard to describe now you know it'll probably sink in over the next couple of days but look it, 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 it's, it's nice when you win you know and what if I'd asked you now to describe Kilku, how would you describe it to me? What sort of place is it? I don't blink anyway because you'll miss it. Uh, yeah, it's look, we're, we're small we are, you know. I'm sure you have heard this over the years, but it's tiny as shopping, two pubs in a chapel. You know, it's a small wee place and probably about a thousand people on it. So and I would say every one of them's here today. And that's it, they really do get behind you. It means a lot to all the fans and supporters to get out and support you. Well, to be honest, this this means this means as much to our supporters than it does to us. You know, like everything we do in the football pitch is for our supporters. Uh, we got beat, we got beat in 2018, and it was tough. But we promised them to, to we promised them not to give up on us. Uh, we're on a fantastic journey here. It's only going to get better. And the year after went in all Ireland final, so hopefully we'll go one step further for them. But and what about tonight? Will you go out tonight? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I would say yeah, but I just asked me how Rooney he said he's just gonna have a pizza. Oh, uh, I love pizza, man. I'm sure I'll probably be carried out of somewhere over me. Aidan Brannigan is with us now, veteran uh, player of the Kaku teams. And Aidan, it must feel lovely to be now able to say whatever 2019 being a breakthrough success in Ulster to be back-to-back -back Ulster champions. And you know, as your goalkeeper just said there, for an area where 
I would say football is pretty much a religion uh, given the amount of people that are playing football from your parish land it must be delightful to be back to back Ulster champions uh, we're over the moon uh, it's just well last year with the COVID not, we were pushing very very hard we still were training thinking that eventually it would open up but it didn't so it's just good to get another year and then after last year was over uh, there was a lot of fella trained on through hard right through so so there's a lot of preparation going in to get this far so it, it, it's, not, it's not just it wasn't easy but we've got there thank god was it a bit of a disappointment for you guys not having a championship because of COVID last year in the Provincial and the All-Ireland because you were so close to overturning Cardiff Inn at Crow Park just a few months before another Provincial series should have started but for the pandemic? It was. Uh, we thought we were in tip-top condition last year in the county final. We thought we were as good as we have ever been, you know what I mean? We thought we, we were absolutely flying and, and we were really enthusiastic. We were training for all year trying to get back there. So... So it, it was it was disheartening, but then it was just a matter of getting the head down and going again and saying getting out of this year. You must be delighted. I remember reading that a couple of years ago before Mickey Moran comes in to manage the team and before you've had now this uh, back-to-back Ulster success and all the success you've had in down over the last few years as well, that you were considering hanging up the boots in your mid-30s and maybe not playing on. You must be delighted you made the decision to keep going for these few years. Yeah, it, it, it's been great. It's been great. But it's, it's just it's been tough going, you know what I mean? Uh, there's a few of us have had a lot of children. Connor, five children as well. Bailey, Jerry, there's a whole lot of us as children. So it is tough to get out. But uh, if you had said four or five years ago that we would have got so much success, you, you know, you wouldn't have believed it. It's been, it's been brilliant. Mention Moran coming in as manager. Like This is remarkable now. I think it's five successive Ulster titles because of his success with Slock Neil before he joined you guys. What does he bring to a team? Because I think it's very clear he's good at picking jobs, firstly, and having the right clubs, but also <laughs> uh, turning these clubs into successful units as well. What does he bring to the party? Uh, I think it's what he brings to the players more so than the game plan or anything. He, he, he changes your mainframe. I think that's the biggest thing he does. And, uh, he just changes the perception of the trainer. And he just, I think that's the angle he takes on it, and that's what's such a big deal. A couple of years ago, when you played Derry Gonley in a Ulster semi final, they made it very sticky for you and they missed a few frees along the way. There was a lot more control in Armagh last Sunday. Was that something you were very conscious about, not giving them the type of chances that were there two years ago for them in the semi final? Uh, well, it was like, to, listen, to be totally honest, Derry Gonley a couple of years ago. They were they were brilliant, you know, and they probably slipped up on them freezing that, and they maybe should have had a speed. But just the other day, look, when it comes to an Ulster final, it is a lot more pressure, and there's a hell of a lot more hype in your club. And sometimes that doesn't help you. I know we played against Cross a few years ago, one of the first finals, and like the game was started 15 minutes. I don't can't remember how much we were down, but we were we, we were just caught, you know, we were like a rabbit in the headlights, and, and I think the same things sort of happened there. Yeah, it's difficult as well if a team goes out with a defensive structure and then once they concede a goal, it can be very difficult to adapt on the fly That's at it. that point as well. That is it. You know, when you're setting up and training for a few weeks before, then, and this is the regimental thing that you have to do, you have to set up and have to stop them from getting goals. Once they get the goal in, you know, the head's dropped, everything's out the window, you know, this isn't supposed to happen, which, and that's what did happen then. You must be delighted with the type of football Kilku are playing currently, though. Like, we were all very impressed with how you played on the front foot against Rammer in the first round of the Ulster Championship, come through a difficult game against Glenn last time out, and then to have played so well in a provincial final and to have run up three goals and ten points at this time of the year, you must be delighted with the style of football that you're playing at the moment. It is, it's, a, it's, a, it's a brilliant style of football. It, it leaves the, the fast players that, that, that can attack, you know, and there is loads of room for them. Surely the first half of the hour day of the match wasn't great to watch, but at the same time, when you're trying to break down 15 men, you, you just have to hold on to the ball. If you're going in there, it's just far too tight. You understand yourself. Mm. Aidan, how you doing? Tommy here. Congrats on the win at the weekend. Um, we've spoken a lot on, on this show about smaller parishes and how they've gone to such heights and you know the link between different brothers or families have, have made a massive difference and I want to ask you about that in a minute because I know you've got your four brothers and your cousins involved as well but uh, Tony McEntee you had a chat with him one night in a pub a couple of years ago I think it was about 15 years ago and you spoke about Kilku being a very average team at that time and McEntee had a word with you that night and you were all captivated by it 
you wouldn't fill us in a bit about what he said, would you? Uh, Tony was actually a guest, or he was actually a guest speaker. Um, it was a, I was actually talking to the other bra and I was telling him how well he had done. He said, no, that actually wasn't me, or that wasn't the bra, that was me. But just, I remember, like, we, we were only young fellas. Um, I don't know what age we were. We were probably 20, like 19 or 20. And we were all, we were all half cut. You know yourself when you're out on a, on a, on a night out with a club. It, it, was a, it was a big night out. Um, after he had spoke, you know, everybody was around the table. And everybody was saying, you know, how much youth was coming through and how much talent was there. And um, we really, he, he, he struck a chord, you know, and everybody was saying there's no, there's no definite, no reason why, why we couldn't do exactly what they had done. He, he had just talked exactly through where his club had been and, and that's where we were at that present time. That's where they were 10 or 15 years previous to that. So uh, there's no, no question or doubt about it. Uh, he changed the main frames that night and it sort of, it went from trying to stay in Division 1 to saying, you know, we could actually... We looked after ourselves, we could actually go the whole way and get an Ulster and whatever. So it, it, um, it definitely was it definitely was brilliant. And was that something you would have spoken about over the years then, what McIntyre said that night? Because, like, we've all been at a table and, you know, a couple of pints in and maybe there's, there's a chap being had by somebody involved in the GA. It doesn't always set in. It doesn't always ring home to people. Like, you can forget about it or you can wake up the next morning and not know what was said. Why did what McIntyre, why did it stay with you, like? Uh, it just did. It, it's just the way he spoke about it. I tell you nothing but the truth. I, 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 I probably never took even a drink after that night. To tell you nothing but the truth. Uh, we just. It was just. It was. It was surreal. Like he just. We just really thought we could do it. You know what I mean? The way he was talking. And it's just there was so much youth coming through at the time and so much talent. And then yeah. the older players there, we had a really good mix. And they were very dedicated in that, you know, and everybody was in there really hard training. And, and the whole club, just from underage right up, was winning. So the club was in a different mainframe and it was going the right way. So everything was just good. And Chris, probably right place, right time. Couldn't have had a better man speaking at the, at the, at the, the club night, you know what I mean? Uh, Daryl Hannan tweeted at the weekend that Daryl Brannigan just tested positive for being the best player in Ulster. <laughs> Sorry, Can you, you talk a bit about Daryl? <laughs> your your you old team, uh, Daryl Hannon was just tweeting at the weekend that Daryl Brannigan is the best player in Ulster. Can you talk to us a bit about Daryl's form? Uh, Daryl didn't do too bad. Uh, he got away well with a goal in that, so he was grand. He was okay. Come on, you're not going to give him too much. No, he's a brother. That's it. That's as good a review as you can, you can get, Tommy, when a player is getting ready for an All-Ireland semi-final in two weeks' time. Yeah. Keep everything on the ground, you know? Uh, Aiden? Well, look, it, it's just... Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Aidan. I was just going to say to you as well about... Tommy mentioned the fact that you have so many brothers involved as well. And I saw the picture at the weekend, you know, you and the four brothers around you on the pitch and plenty of cousins and relations there as well. Does that make it all the more special, having a group of brothers around at you know such a good time for the club? I think it's good, I think it's good to have brothers playing with you because they'd be so brutally honest. You know what I mean? Uh, you know there was nobody. If you don't do something well, you're told about it. And if you do something well, well, you're told you're okay. You know what I mean? You could do better. I think that's a good thing. It, it keeps you improving all the time. Even even at training and that, you know, it, it it's extremely hot and heavy for places at the minute because we're going so well and everybody's pushing yeah. to get in. So you couldn't ask for a better thing. You know what I mean? Is the approach slightly different getting ready for Port Leash now in a couple of weeks' time compared to the 2019-2020 season where going into the All-Ireland Series and having come out of Ulster was new ground? That You've got the experience now of having played in a semi-final, having been to Crow Park to play in a final. Does that change the approach anyway compared to two years ago? It definitely does. You know, uh, it makes a massive difference. Like I seen us in the change rooms the other day on you know, just thought we were going out for a training session. You know, there was no word of the match. There was nobody hyped up. It was just a totally different atmosphere. And three or four people had remarked me to it, saying, I think we're in a good place today. You know, there's no hype, no nerves. It was just, we were going there to do do a job. We had been well drilled at home. We knew what everybody was doing, and that was it. It definitely makes a massive difference. When you're going to your first match, first to first playing, like there's some pressure on you, and everybody at home, that's all everybody wants to talk about, whereas 
before the Ulster final, it wasn't mentioned once to me. You know, there wasn't one person said, oh, what about the big game? Or that it just, just wasn't mentioned. So it was, it does leave, it does leave you very, it leaves it easy going in, you know what I mean? Well, it should be a great semi-final between yourselves and Finbars at Amore Park in two weeks' time. Aidan, thanks a million for joining us on the Club Championship Show. Thank you so much. Tommy, let's, Aiden, best of luck. let's have a chat about the game that you were at because we know now yeah. both sides of that draw it's going to be St. Finbars who Kilku are going to play. We mentioned already that they got basically the dream start, the balls and net within the opening minute. Uh, they were in yeah. really good control by half-time and even by the second water break. And then there's a serious wobble when stacks come back into the game. And if it wasn't mm. for some good goalkeeping and maybe holding on just towards the end of the game, Finbars could have messed this up. 100%. It, it was incredible, Will. It was one of those games where you really saw the power of momentum in sport. And you nearly, I think I tweeted at half time that Austin Stacks have nothing to lose. Or maybe I WhatsApp Joe Malloy. I was trying to keep him in the loop on what was happening. I said, Austin mm. Stacks have been so bad that they have nothing to lose. So anything could happen. But I didn't expect it to happen the way it did. Um, you mentioned John Cairns there, the, the Finbar's goalkeeper. He was very important to them winning at the weekend. He was the superstar in their semi-final win against Castlehaven in the Cork Championship. They won on penalties that day. And uh, he, I think he saved he saved a couple and he scored one as well. He scored the winner. So uh, John's influence in the semi-final against Austin Stacks came down to the fact that Finbars were six up at half time, And they were in the groove. They were flying. Everything they touched was going over the bar. On the flip side, Stacks couldn't make that click. Sean Quilter was shown, got a couple of nice scores, but it wasn't always coming off for him. And they were, he was the only player, really, that Stacks were able to find in their forward line. When the second half started, Greg Horan from Stacks grabbed the game by the neck and he just ran at Finbars. He kicked two points, one of three that Quilter pointed. In a blink of an eye, they were back within a point. And just before the water break, and we've spoken about the water breaks over and over again on, on, on the GA over the last couple of years and the influence that they have, Quilter had a free to equalise it. And if he had got it, I'm pretty sure we'd be talking about Austin Stacks and Kilku in an All-Ireland semi-final here. He just missed the free. It was a tight angle. Then the game play, the game-winning play happens. The the water break happens. Paul O'Keefe is roaring at his players. And when they're shouting and roaring going on in the water break, you're never sure what's going to happen off the back of it. John Cairns, the goalkeeper, puts the ball down. And he picks out Ian Maguire with a beautiful kick out. Maguire up in the air, fetches it. Down the field, they have a point in five seconds. Finbars are settled. It was their only. It was their first score of the second half. And you're talking nearly 20 minutes into that second yeah, half. What Nothing happened was going at, right for them. What happened if the scores dried up, Tommy? Because I actually yeah. uh, flicked around for a few minutes because I felt early in the second half that this game was pretty much over. Came mm. back and I'm like, Finbars haven't scored in a long time here. Check Twitter, yeah. saw it had gone on to 20 minutes without a score. What happened in that 20 minute period that they just weren't able to score? I think there was two sides to it, Will. Um, I spoke to John Cairns, the goalkeeper, after the game and he spoke about the full court press that he was facing, that he could just see Donahue's handprints all over it. There was three banks of four up against it. Um, we would have seen a good bit of that in County Devon and plenty of, of club teams try it too. But Stacks pulled it off so well in that second half. Finbars couldn't get out for quite a bit. Stacks were taking their points. But on the flip side, Finbars had their chances, but they were taking wild shots and they were taking wild passes. There was a couple of bizarre passes that went in uh, where the two corner forwards would have made a run right across the near post and the ball ends up over the far post. Nobody within about 30 yards. Um, one of the biggest things about the game in Temple at the weekend, like you knew that Austin Sachs and the Rockies were going to bring an atmosphere, but the Finbar's support were unbelievable. Speaking to some of the players after the game, you could hear, or you, you got the sense that Aero Oog from Clare outnumbered them in Parky Rin in the Munster quarterfinal. But the noise that they brought, Ale Le Bleu was ringing out throughout the game. Um, but it all quietened. Once Stacks got on top, the momentum went against them. It's a funny thing in sport. Finbar is completely wilted. Like they did. Mm. Like, and I, they spoke about it after the game, a number of the players. That has happened to them time and time again throughout this year, where they've had a poor third quarter. I'm not sure they can put their finger on why it's happening. They were able to pull it out of the bag. Uh, John Cairns came up with a massive save just before they got their match winning goal. I don't know if they're going to get away with a third quarter like that against Kilku. No, you can't afford it against Kilku. Like Kilku, you probably didn't get to see much because you would have been doing the interviews after the game mm. on Sunday afternoon, but was watching the match on the TV. And look, there'd be plenty of people who'd be critical about Derry Gonnelly's approach compared to two years ago where they were more in the face of Kilku. They decided to pretty much camp inside their own 45, make themselves hard to break down and then go on the break against Kilku. But yeah. Kilku were happy that every time they got the ball back, they just recycled possession. And it was... A remarkable performance in terms of just sheer control from a team. If Finbar's played like they did in that second half, Kilku will go through them. That that has to be the lesson they take out of Thurlis from last weekend. 
Yeah, and like Paul O'Keefe, the Finbar's manager, talks about playing quite an attacking style and, and it's served them quite well this year. They've got a very, very talented uh, full forward line mm. who've racked up big scores. Um, but they were quite ish at the weekend, their full forward line. Like Brian Hayes, who started, um, he had number 30 on his back. He kicked three great points. But Stephen Sherlock, he came up with four points, a couple of frees. He was quiet ish in that game. Killian Myers Murray scored a goal and a point, but he was taken off early in the second half. McCrickard didn't score. He's been racking up big scores in the club championship so far. But what was impressive, even though Paul O'Keefe talks about playing with a, an attacking philosophy and an attacking style of football, their one on one defending was very good. They were, like it was very good at the weekend. I'm not sure that's gonna how that's gonna stack up against Kilku, who play in their the style that we've seen for the last couple of years. I asked Paul O'Keefe would he change the way he's playing, um, change their setup to you know in, in terms of who they're facing at the weekend, um, and he said that they wouldn't like they'd play their game. So well, in theory, it makes for a very interesting game, Tommy, because it's going to be attack against counter attack, and Kilku yeah. will probably be happy enough to retreat back. You come and try and beat us, and then we'll take you on the counter. And neither Finbar's yeah. attackers are going to shine on the day, or Kilku are going to take space on the counter attack. It could make for a really good game. And that's a dangerous game, you know, to play as well because Kulku are obviously going to go in as favourites. You know, they rank Carfin so close before. And if a team like Finbars, I get the sense that if a team like Finbars get a bit of a run and they get they get their noise going, you know, if the the Finbars crowd are singing, if they they believe in themselves, they've won all around them in Cork at underage level. They'd be similar enough profiles in terms of that that they've got good groups together. Um, similar to Kulku, they've got a good group that have been playing together the whole way through. A couple of county stars. You know, if Finbars get a bit of a run on them, um, they'll fully back themselves. But going off what we've seen over the last couple of years, and and like I was impressed with Finbars at the weekend, I'd be still leaning towards Kilku. I think mm. they've just Kilku have just something about them this year. Remarkable to think hurling and football royalty in St Finbars waiting since 1986 uh, to win their oh, yeah. latest Munster Club Football Championship title. Yeah. Uh, Tommy, after the game, uh, spoke to two-time All-Star defender with Cork, uh, Michael Shields, and this is what he had to say about the victory against Austin Stacks. But that start that you had, a goal after 18 seconds, you were down on the programme to start at number 11, but Brian Hayes, where number 30, started in your place, came into the edge of the square at the start, clearly it was a set-piece move, it worked. Yeah, look, Brian's kind of mixing in and out, like, and he, he stayed in for a start, and luckily enough, he got a hand into Killian, who got the goal, and he took it well, to be fair, so um, it definitely set us off in the right track. I think we kicked three or four points in on the trot, and we were looking comfortable, but... Look, that's been the story of our season all year. It's something we try to cut out, not letting teams back into it when we do get, a, get ahead. But look, again, we're there now. We're thrilled to get over the line. And uh, I think it's semi-finals in two weeks, so it's back training Tuesday night and just looking forward to the, the few weeks ahead. At half-time, you're, you're six clear. And as you said, I think you'd kick six on the bounce. Six out of the last seven scores you'd kicked. So you were flying. Tails were up. And you could probably tell the stacks were flat. They probably had nothing to lose going out in that second half. I'd imagine you were expecting a bit of a response. How do you stop it? when it happens yeah look it's, it's a tricky one like, we're kind of asking ourselves that question all year because um, we've done that a few times this year but look I think you just need to have cool heads around the pitch um, I think our bench made a big difference today when they came on um, Owen McGreevy was very good as well when he started today Brian Hayes made a big difference and then the likes of Enda who came, the right, or Enda, who came on did uh, very well you know, kind of settled things a bit more so look we're, again look it's, it's a hard one to put your finger on I think you need to get a free or just settle it down some way but look we don't really care at this stage we're, just, we're over the line we're into the semi-final now yeah, Finbar's one of the nicest GA uh, jerseys in the club championship currently yeah. as well. Uh, so the semi-finals, which are coming up on Sun or Saturday week, will be Kilku of Down against St Finbar's of Cork. That's at Amore Park, 3 p.m. The game will be on TG Carr. Chemical Croaks of Dublin against Porrick Pierce's of Roscommon. Kingspan Breffney, five o'clock. TG Carr showing that one as well. So two games to really look forward to. Uh, we're looking forward to this weekend now and the hurling championship semi-finals. Uh, the fixtures for this weekend, we've got Slock Neil of Derry, who are going to be going up against Bally Gunner. That game is on in Parnell Park in Dublin. And then we've got in Thurlis Bally Hale Shamrocks against St. Thomas. That is Kilkenny against Galway. And a repeat of the 2019 All Ireland final. Delighted to say that Michael Verney of the Irish Independent is with us now to look forward to what on the face of Mick should be two pretty interesting hurling games this weekend. Yeah, I think uh, great to be with you, lads. I think the cream has definitely uh, risen to the top here. We have the best four teams in the country competing in the All Ireland semi finals. And while you probably have two um, reasonably overwhelming favourites in, in Bally Hale and Bally Gunner, like, would you be that surprised if there was two shocks or it's not the All Ireland final pairing that we expect in Bally Hale and Bally Gunner? You wouldn't be that surprised. So I think, yeah. Uh, a massive, massive Sunday. They're obviously back to back on on the box on TG Catter on uh, on Sunday, and just so many uh, things to look forward to. Will Bally Gunner, you know, finally get to the All Ireland final? Can Bally Hale, 
keep this going where, you know, to get to potentially do a, a hat-trick of All-Irelands with a gap year in between. Um, can Schlock Neil finally get to a final? Can Thomas's, um, you know, probably get a bit of redemption from the performance against Boris Lee a couple of years ago? And as you said there, a bit of redemption mm. for the 2019 All-Ireland final defeat to Ballyhale. Mm. So there's so many ponderables this weekend. Yeah, if we can start with the second game, we'll go back to front in this one with Ballyhale Shamrocks against St. Thomas. Casting the eye back to 2019, people were thinking maybe St. Thomas can recreate their success of 2013, go to Crow Park and beat a fancy Ballyhale team. And Ballyhale really let loose at Crow Park day, that day. 17 points was the margin of victory in the end. One of the best performances we've seen in an All-Ireland final. I'm sure that becomes inspiration for Ballyhale to try and do it again. But also it has to be huge motivation for St. Thomas not to take a defeat like that again. Uh, massive will, yeah. There's probably... Um there's probably some things that went on in the Thomas's camp in the build-up to that game that uh, will maybe never be reported or have gone under the radar, but they had a far from smooth preparation going into the All-Ireland final in the week going into that final. And then, like, during the game, you know, Fintan Burke, one of their best players, picked up a cruciate injury and even stayed on the field a couple of minutes after picking up the cruciate injury. They were, they were under pressure from the off. That put further pressure on them. They were, just came up against the Valley Hale side, who were, you know, just in a different league that day. And Thomas's just things conspired against him probably in the build-up to the game and even during the game as well. And you know that shot at redemption. Then they had it against Borussia League in the other semi-final, semi-final a year later. Were you know underperformed again. So now they're back at the stage that they've craved to be at. I'm sure. Outside of maybe Bally Gunner and Bally Hale and maybe Schlock Neil, they would have been the ones that would have been really hurt by you no know, All Ireland uh, and provincial campaign last year. They have a chance to to right a few wrongs, but they also have you know a massive uh, a massive absence going into the game on uh, on Sunday with Shane Cooney missing. Looks like he's going to be out for the season with yeah. with Gal- with Galway as well. Like he's a massive loss. Mm-hmm. The only thing I'd say about that is at least they know, you know, a couple of weeks in advance and that they can plan. At least it's not something that's picked up in a warm up where you really have to shuffle your deck on the day and at least everybody knows what their role is going to be going into Sunday. And if something else, some other kind of a wild card is thrown at them, that's fair enough and they'll try and deal with that in the day. But at least they've had a bit of time to deal with this. And I'm sure uh, I'm sure Kenneth Burke has plans in place of what they're going to do uh, by putting someone in new centre back. But it also takes away it, it is a problem. You look at who they have to stop in the Ballyhale attack. You're looking at obviously TJ, Colin Fenley, Adrian Mullen. Um, you're looking at Owen Cody as well, a two time uh, young hurler of the year. And Shane Cooney, you know, would pick up one of them and would they would probably fancy their chances of him maybe um quieting him one of them. So it does put an added pressure on their, their defence, but at least they know a few weeks in advance that they have to make changes. I'm sure they've been making them, maybe played a challenge game in the meantime as well, or played a, an in-house game where somebody new has slotted into centre-back. That Bally Hell Shamrock's forward line, which they're going to try and stop, Mick, is it the best forward line we've ever seen at club level? Oh, jeez, Will, I'd, I'd have to say so. Like You look at it as well, you name the four of them and one of their best forwards was missing for the Leinster final in Joey Cuddy, who's just put up brilliant scores, probably a player that wasn't heard of much coming into this season. And he's another player. So you focus on TJ, you focus on Colin Fenley, Adrian Mullen goes to town, Owen Cody goes to town. So uh, I would say it's probably the best forward line we've ever seen at, at club level. Like, would that would that forward line do well at county level? Yes, it, pro- it probably would, just outside, you know, the really elite, maybe playing against the Limericks of this world. So, um, yeah, you wouldn't like to be... I put it to you this way, an awful lot has to go right from your matchup point of view. You know, a couple of those Bally Hale forwards are going to have to have an off day and you're going to have to get your matchups absolutely spot on and you're going to have to deny an awful lot of space in their defence for you to beat them. They could just, like, a regular score for Bally Hale to be putting up is, you know, 123, 124. That's the calibre of forward forward that they have. And then that's not to mention Ronan Corcoran or Brian Cody coming through from midfield who can hit three or four in a game and has been doing that throughout the Leinster campaign. So, yeah, it's a, it's as potent a forward line as you're going to get. Can I ask you about their form, Mick? Um, like St. Thomas has obviously had the long wait around the gorse, um, the, the the game of court with the, with the COVID outbreak. Ballyhale Shamrocks came through that huge scare against St. Rhinus after extra time. Did, do you have any worries about that? Were you looking at that thinking uh, has something changed here over the last couple of years? Yeah, I would have had worries, uh, Tommy, to be honest with you. Um, and looking back at the Kilkenny County final, O'Loughlin Gales really laid it down to them for the guts of about 45 minutes. 
And I think they were five down maybe a minute or two into injury time, a half time in that game. I think they got it back to three and, uh, and kind of steamrolled them then maybe in the fight in, you know, between the third and four quarters, that county final. Uh, got a big lead against Mount Leinster Rangers, let it slip and let Mount Leinster Rangers back into the game in that quarter final only for a, a very good save from Dean Mason. They could have been under pressure. They were beaten. It, they looked a beaten docket against Rhinus. Rhinus were the yeah. better team for about 40, 45 minutes. Joey Cuddy was sent off just before half time. They couldn't deal with with, uh, with Stephen Wynn as the extra man for Rhinus. But they somehow conjured, you know, conjured that late goal at the end on Cody. And then just like it was like a release valve in extra time. They yes. never looked like they were going to be beaten when they got back to 15. And yeah, I would have had a lot of doubts. And even 15 or 20 minutes into the, the Leinster final against Clock, you're thinking, you know, Clock are well in this game despite conceding a couple of goals. And then all of a sudden, they just put the foot in the accelerator and just disappeared off into the distance. So I kind yeah. of, I'm kind of, I'm kind, I'm kind of thinking if you were going to catch them, you would have caught them by now. Yeah. And they've kind of played through their rocky form, still managed to get results and they're back where they want to be. Have they, you know, going down through their history, have they ever underperformed at the All Ireland stages? Not really. Once, you know, yeah. if you're going to get them, you're usually going to get, you're going to knock them out at an earlier stage. So, they are seasoned pros when it comes to this stage, and I'd imagine they are cranking up for a massive performance at the weekend. It's scary. I suppose it's always... Go on, Tommy. Sorry. Well, it's, it's, well, it's always tricky, lads, trying to analyse greatness as you're mm. watching it in, in real time, you know? Like, we, <laughs> how many years are we asking, like, surely this is Dublin, like, surely this is... How, how long more can Dublin go on? And they went through spells where they looked like Mayo might catch them, or even this year, they looked like... It was hard to believe that they were shaky at times in, in some of those games against Mead or early in the game. Even against Mayo, you didn't believe they were going to lose that game. So I suppose until Ballyhell Shamrocks are beaten, it's very hard to question them. Yeah, the, the greats always find a way, don't they? Um, and you can analyse their form and kind of say, it, it's kind of, as you said there, Tommy, it's kind, it can kind of go either way. You can say, oh, the writing was on the wall from the Rhinus game or the writing was on the wall from the Mount Leinster game or the old Auckland Gales game. But then mm. they turn it on against Clock and you just think, OK, they've gone through that rocky patch now. They're on an even keel again. Um, they have, like, Colin Fenley, by his standards, was totally out of form going into the Leinster final. Now he's back in form. Uh, TJ's probably played himself back into form and had a bit of time to get over. I think he had, uh, he had an injury going through the provincial campaign as well. They've all had a bit of time. They've, As I said, they've Joey Cuddy back as well. I believe they have a clean bill of health. Darren Mullen was back for the Leinster final. Um, so, like, <laughs> I think they're... They're ripe now and they're ready They're ready to go for this weekend. Any any doubts you would have had about them are probably gone now at this stage. They've had time probably to settle down, get a bit of rest, get a bit of downtime into their, maybe some of their older kind of players, particularly TJ, uh, Joey Holden and probably Colin Fenley and even Owen Reid. And I'd say they're ready to explode again this weekend. The argument for St. Thomas then, Michael, given, look, Conor Cooney's been shooting the lights out, but... Is it a big ask to say they'll win or is there any indication that you know, even given their key injury where Shane Cooney's not going to be involved, is there an argument to be made for St. Thomas here? Oh, there definitely is, yeah. Um, if you look at, at Thomas's, uh, they have an ability to grind out results within Galway. It didn't play particularly well against Claren Bridge, kind of ground out that game. There were semi-finals, quarter-finals, even against Turlock la- last year in the county final where they grounded out, maybe did, didn't look like it at different stages. Funnily enough, once they've gotten outside of Galway, their ability to grind out results maybe hasn't been uh, hasn't been maybe as reflective. Um, they're probably a lot more reliant on you know a Connor Cooney who's who shot the lights out in the county final. Like you, you couldn't say on the flip side that Ballyhale are over reliant on, on any one player really because different lads step up on a different day. So you'd imagine Ballyhale will try and tag uh, Connor Cooney whether that's. Richie Reid goes out and picks him up, or one of it, maybe Brian Cody, midfielder, drops back and picks him up. But Ballyhale, you'd imagine, would think that they would have a lot of their work done if they can stop Cooney. And um, I don't know whether David Burke maybe is going to have to slip back centre back, or, you know, because they're missing a centre back, is everybody going, to, everybody going to have to fall back a bit? And they're losing a bit of their kind of potency in attack as a result. But to be honest, this is a perfect situation for Thomas's. All the pressure is on them in Galway every year. The first Galway team to do four in a row since Turlock did it in the 60s. The pressure is always on them in Galway. The pressure is not on them now at the All-Ireland stages. I'm sure it's on them um, from within the camp, but it's not, you know, everybody's expecting a Ballyhale, Bally Gunner final. And mm. um, I'm, I'm sure they're primed to produce something big, but Shane Cooney missing, like, 
what I do say about having time to prepare for that is fine, but he's a ma- he's a massive, massive loss. Like just picture missing the centre back on any any team in the country. You take like centre back is probably going to be your best player. They're without him now, um, and a lot of other lads are going to have to step up. And there probably maybe would be question marks about while Thomas is fifteen or sixteen, first fifteen or sixteen players very strong. That maybe after that, like a lot of club teams, the depth the depth isn't there, so they're going to have to go into their squad on Sunday now if they're going to have to, if they're going to get over Valley Hill. Looking at the other game, then we were talking to Chris McCaig from Slough Neil just before Christmas, and they had nearly a month to wait until they played the eventual Munster champions, who we now know are a very impressive Bally Gunner team after their win against Kilmallock a couple of weeks ago. But he was saying the one issue that Slough Neil have, Michael, is the fact that for the last half decade they've come out of Ulster, they've given the Piercy a good run, they've given Bally Hale a good run but they don't get exposure to that kind of top-level club hurling often enough. And that's what makes it so difficult to raise your game for one semi-final to try and get to an All-Ireland final. Yeah, the geography of it, like, we we don't think about it, like, but the geography of it, like, they have to go two hours to get a really competitive challenge game. They're, they're not, unless they're playing probably maybe county teams up in Ulster, unless they're playing an Antrim or unless they're playing maybe the Derry county team or the Down county team, they're going to probably have to travel down to Abbottstown or... At Lone or Tullamore or somewhere midway to play uh, one of the big club teams or even some county teams as well. So it's kind of kind of like as you say there, it's once off exposure to really big games. Now, the couple of times, the last couple of times, they've been you know very very close. As you say, pushing the Pierce really close in 2018. That game was also in Parnell Park, which I think is a help. Pushed Ballyhale very close in 2020. That game was in Newry again similar kind of surroundings to Parnell Park and I do think that is a help for them going into the game at the weekend you're looking at Bally Gunner in the, the Munster final and you're just thinking Tessie Hutchinson is going to absolutely go to town here in space and he did mm. but, but like anyone that's played up in Parnell Park and you can talk about d- dimensions and maybe the dimensions aren't that different Parnell Park is tight mm. Parnell Park is very tight and you'd hope from a Stock Neil point of view that it would be harder for the likes of Desi Hutchinson to maybe find space within Parnell Park which is quite a claustrophobic venue at the best of times and if you look at it from a Schnock Neil point of view they've got lots of big powerful players that could dominate a game in Parnell Park you're looking at Cormac O'Doherty Brendan Rogers at, at club level if, if he'd love to see him playing more at county level but at club level he's an absolute powerhouse so hard to stop Chrissy McCaig as well Shane McGuigan um, all these guys that are playing you know inter-county football with Derry and are going to be kicking Division 2 football later on this year they're the sort of lads that could really dominate in this smaller venue. So I do think that's a big plus for them. We're talking to Fintan O'Toole about Desi Hutchinson's form last week. He reckons this has been a transformative change, his return back home from England, that he just adds that bit of extra pace, that extra bit of spice that maybe Ballygunner wouldn't have had four or five years ago. I, I just had a couple of notes written down on Desi. So before he played in the uh, 2019 Waterford Championship, he hadn't played a competitive hurling match in six years because he was off playing soccer. And he actually played a bit with the Waterford footballers mm-hmm. that year. So in his first county final appearance he's, in 2019, he scored one three and got man of the match. A year later, he put four points on the board. Don't think he got man of the match, but still a brilliant performance. Uh, the 2021 county final, he hit one nine from play and was the best player on the pitch. He's had two years of inter-county exposure. He was nominated for an All-Star in both of those years. Five points against Lockmore Castellini in monsoon-like conditions. Uh, from seven shots in the Munster final against Kilmallock, he hit one five from play. He's, he's just turned 25. Like, this lad is only going to get better and better. And the style that, the style that Banny Gunner play would have to remind you of the way Limerick play as well. It's it's not like you, you try to stop one of them, but you're not like it's it's a whole kind of machine functioning all as one. When do you see them, you know, give away a kind of a wasteful possession away? When do you see them ballooning a the ball into the attack? You don't. And the way they play perfectly suits the likes of Desi. It's always a real sympathetic ball into the forward. Always, nearly always favours the forward, 80 20. And He's probably was probably the marquee player up up, up top that they were just crying out for to um, maximise the system that they play. Will he get the space that he craves on Sunday? Probably not, and it's probably going to be maybe a different. Maybe he'll have to be a creator on Sunday, which like which he's shown he's as good as creating as he is at finishing. But um, yeah, like I think he's only going to get better. Like he's another 
minimum, you know, five to six seasons, you'd say with Watford, more if he stays injury free and he will only get better and better. So that's a really exciting thing for Bally Gunner and it's a really exciting thing for Watford as well. You mentioned about Bally Hale not letting up in the Leinster final. Similarly, Bally Gunner did the same once they got on top of Kilmallock. There was no slowing down and no mercy shown in that game. No, they, um, they're like, it's like it's kind of reminiscent of Limerick or reminiscent of that Great Kilkenny team. If they can beat you 10 points, they'll beat you 15 points. They'll just keep the foot on, on your throat. In fairness to Kilmallock, they, they look like at one stage, instead of me notes there, it looked like they were going to get absolutely an, an awful hiding. And in fairness, they finished out. And I think, you know, they got 1 7 or 1 8, I think, in the final quarter to make it look a bit more respectable. But like Bally Gunner are putting up massive scores. I think it was 3 20. The last day, I think it was just that they put up the same against uh, Ballier. And yeah. I think cr- crucial for them, they showed that they can do it and get down and dirty against Lockmore. And listen, a lot of people mightn't have liked it, but they did what they had to do to get over the line. And I'm sure that was hanging over them. You know, people say, we, you know, Winter Hurling doesn't suit us. People say we can't win a dogfight. And I think that'll be crucial going into Sunday because the odds mightn't suggest it, but this is going to be a dogfight on Sunday. Schlock Neil are probably still very underrated, even at All Ireland level, despite what they've done. And I know they haven't made it to a final, but they're going to turn this into a dogfight. And from a Bally Gunner point of view, it's good that that muscle memory is there from you know what their penultimate game against Lockmore, that they can win this tough game, that they can do what they have to do to get over the line. Because maybe that would have been a question mark about them in the not too recent past. One thing Slockney will have to do is try and reduce down chances that they concede in front of their goal though on a final note because Tommy was at the Ballier game and we saw the scoring percentage from Ballygunner that day. They barely wasted the ball in front of goal. Uh, similarly, yeah. they made the most of their chances against Kilmallock the last day as well. This is a very efficient unit that Ballygunner are coming with. Oh, big time, yeah. Um, I, just, just a quick aside, um, the statsman for Limerick, Sean, Sean O'Donnell, who would be well heralded as like the best statsman in the country, is also... The stats man for Bally Gunner, and I, they do play uh, this high percentage game of like where you know we shoot within a certain zone, we play high percentage hurling that's high percentage ball going into the forward line that they're going to retain, that's high percentage uh, areas that they're taking their shots from. So, yeah, like not they're not going to waste chances. I don't envisage them like hitting double figure, uh, double figures in wides. They're very, very economical. And any team that's going to beat them is going to have to be similarly economical if they are going to beat them. Mm. Nick, just the last one. How do you qualify as the the most impressive stats man in the country? Just out of interest. What would uh, you need? Like? Oh, geez, that's a good. It's a good question. Is it, is it, is I, it like is it analysing and crunching the numbers and how you feed it back to the management team? I, need, I look. I just think I'll let you answer in a second. But the the Limerick comparison with Barry Gunner, I hadn't thought of it, but I started getting flashbacks there of them tackling and packs against Ballier, and they hadn't Ballier hadn't experienced anything like that before when they met them in the first round of Munster. So it's a good comparison. I like the comparison, but I am yeah, a lot. So how, do you, yeah. how can you beat the best stats man in the country? <laughs> I think a lot of it is is probably thinking outside the box. What do a lot of us think of with, with stats? We think of uh, puck out retention, which is obviously true. Scoring percentage, which is obviously true too. There are some of the obvious things you would look at. But by all accounts, a, a big part of what Limerick look at, a big part of what Ballygunner look at is, you know, how many contacts are you making within a game? Um, what's, what's your tackle count like? And I'm not just necessarily talking about hooks and blocks, which can actually, if you look at a game, the losing team a lot of times can have more hooks and blocks than, than the winning team. I'm talking about how many, you know, how, if, if someone is in possession, is he, yeah. is he been made contact with twice while he's in possession? Are you turning him? Are you uh, making sure that he doesn't, is not able to go the route that he goes? So I think that would be one of the big things that some of the top stats lads would look at. Look at. Just a quick one on Shawnee O'Donnell. So he's been involved with Bally Gunner during the, the guts of the eight in a row in, in, uh, in Waterford. He was involved with Frank Flannery when Owlert won Leinster. I think he works with Frank Flannery no matter where he is. And he's won a lot uh, around Cork as well. He's been with Bally Gunner. He's been with Limerick. He's been with, um, he, he was actually not poached, but he was with Cork and John Kiley got him with Limerick. And it has helped. Again, it, it's just a, another part of get, having yeah. the best on, on your side. And uh, I don't exactly know what qualifies as being the best stats man, but if you're looking at the CV, I'd say, I, I say that would tell you a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Squeezing those extra few percentages. Uh, Mick, thanks a million for joining us on the Club Championship Show. Cheers, lads.
those uh, two All-Ireland Club semi-finals this Sunday to look forward to them both being screened on TG Carr you've got Slock Neal of Derry against Ballygunner of Waterford Parnell Park half past one on Sunday and then two hours later half past three Semple Stadium it's Ballyhill Shamrocks going for three All-Ireland titles in a row up against the 2013 champion St Thomas and they are the four in a row Galway champions Tommy before I let you go on this you've got your big announcement coming up on Monday new football mm. pod co-host the name has to change over the the sign is to change over the shop effectively here when you get a second name yeah. in as well but you're keeping it under your hat until Monday well we're, we're tweaking the name not changing too much Will we're just going to shorten it I think to the football pod um, is this future proofing it in case you end up losing other hosts eventually no not necessarily no, no not at right. all um, I just think that it's earned that title of being mm. called the football pod you know half a million listeners last year wasn't too bad so obviously we lost Andy heartbreaking this week that episode is out now he joined us for a farewell podcast uh, he also slipped back into he, he kind of took off the Leitrim half for a little bit and he talked a bit about Oshin Mullen we talked about Tyrone getting hammered by Cavan and, and Paddy talked about being a dub coming home from sunning yourself in Jamaica throughout January and playing some of Burn Cup games so uh, what it's like being when you crash down to earth after winning the All-Ireland so loads of good stuff this week just before we finish I'd mm-hmm. love to hear your predictions for the weekend because you usually catch me out with my predictions and I let people down although I did call Kilku a long time ago I want to hear what you're thinking for this weekend OK, so we're just looking at the two hurling games then on Sunday yeah, afternoon. I, like, I'd love to be original and go, it's going to be Slot Neal in the final and it's going to be St. Thomas. But just the two favourites going into this weekend, the Munster and Leinster champions, Bally Gunner and Bally Hale, just looked irresistible yeah. in their recent finals. And I think it will have helped them the fact that they've played more recently than both Slot Neal and St. Thomas as well. It feels a long time uh, since those two teams have played. So I, I think they're going to be tighter maybe than, say, some of the predictions that we've seen so far this week. But I think we are going to see Bally Gunner into a first All-Ireland final to take on Bally Hale. And my word, what a final that'll be if it proves to be those two who meet in the decider. So going to be very interesting. We can get your predictions then on the football next week uh, ahead of those yeah. semi-finals on Saturday week. Yeah, it's going to be a great weekend of hurling. Can't wait for it. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to being wrong. We'll be looking back on those two mm-hmm. semi-finals from this coming Sunday on next week's pod, and we'll also be looking forward to the football, uh, the football All Ireland uh, semi-finals even on Saturday week. We'll be back next Wednesday at half past ten. The Club Championship Show on OTB Sports in partnership with AIB, proud sponsors of the football hurling and camogie All Ireland Club Championships. Hashtag the toughest.